Welcome to our service of night prayer. This is a quieter, more reflective service intended to be prayed towards the end of the day, a chance to reflect on all that's happened, to commit it to the Lord and to pray for his safekeeping through the night. So I invite you to join in with the words that will come in capital letters as we pray together and then reflect on a passage of scripture. Let's be quiet for a moment and pray. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let's say it together. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Prior to the passage we are about to hear, we're told that Jesus was agonising in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And after hours of intense prayer, he rises to go and meet the crowd coming to arrest him because Judas, one of his own followers, betrayed him. And then Jesus was arrested. Peter drew his sword and severed the ear of the high priest's servant. But Jesus immediately brought the situation under control by rebuking Peter and healing the soldier's ear. Finally, the other 11 of Jesus' disciples were so afraid for their lives that they all forsook him and fled. Jesus was left alone, now in the hands of his enemies, and their intention is to kill him. He was taken to face his accusers, but Jesus was fully committed to drink the cup that his father had given him. Jesus was determined to be lifted up on a cross, thereby providing the way of salvation that he and the prophets had promised. Now, Jesus actually had three stages of a trial before the church and three stages before the state. Firstly, with the church, he was taken that night to Annas, a previous high priest, a bit like a preliminary hearing. Then with Caiaphas, the current high priest, also at night. Then the full Sanhedrin, like a church council, around daybreak for the conclusion. And then he had to go through it all again with the state. Firstly with Pilate, then Herod, and then back to Pilate. So by this, we know that both Jews and the Gentiles found that Jesus deserved death. So let's listen to Mark 14. Verses, 30, verses 53 to 65. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the gods and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet, even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? 
I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. And then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So on the passing of the verdict, the forces of restraint that had been upon these priests and scribes and elders seemed to be lifted. They began to vent their hatred upon Jesus and pour out in venomous abuse all the pent-up jealousy and hatred they'd gathered against him. And while Jesus was in the midst of the Sanhedrin, just outside the outer courtyard, where he could look in and see all that was happening, Peter sat with the guards around the fire on that chilly night in Jerusalem. Peter, at this stage, had not completely deserted Jesus. He'd not accompanied him openly, as he'd boasted that he would, but at least he seemed to have shown more courage than the other disciples in following Jesus this far. So he was watching this, and he never forgot it, because in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, he tells us we are to remember that scene. For Christ was our example. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And so we learn that this is how Christians are to respond when they're falsely accused, when they are unjustly vilified and abused. Instead of retorting and trying to justify ourselves, Peter says, we are to return good for evil. Revile not in return, but commit ourselves to him who is able to judge things justly. Is that a tough ask for you? Because on occasion, it is for me. And I imagine it is for many others. But don't forget, we have Christ as our example and the Holy Spirit to help us. Now the religious court had full power over religious matters, but it had no power to carry out the death penalty. But it could prepare a charge on which the criminal could be tried before the Roman governor. The policy of the Sanhedrin forbids the asking of questions to a person on trial that would incriminate him. But the high priest did ask Jesus, in verse 61, if he was the Messiah. And when Jesus answered that he was, this is what they'd all been waiting for. Verse 64 tells us, they said, this is blasphemy. And the Sanhedrin then condemned Jesus guilty and worthy of death. So here we have Jesus and Caiaphas standing face to face, representing two high priests. Caiaphas was a fleshly high priest, and Jesus, on the other hand, was a high priest according to the Spirit of God. Such a statement that he would destroy the temple would have been looked on as blasphemy in itself, and the idea that he would destroy it and then build it in three days was seen as a messianic claim. So on the basis of that claim, they maintained that he was deserving of death. I'm not going to talk about the many elements that made the trial illegal, but suffice to say, Jesus was convicted before he was even tried. And it is this group that Jesus had been challenging from the beginning, opposing their laws, their governance, and claiming that God would set them aside. Now they're confronting Jesus, and they have all the power, all the authority, and they can do whatever they want. But we must remember that Jesus chose the cross himself. If he'd spoken the truth a little bit differently, 
If he'd been a bit clearer, then maybe he would not have died. If he'd consulted with any of his own disciples, they would have spoken of the benefit of remaining with them. If he'd listened to his own body, sweating blood and crying out for deliverance, he would have forsaken this plan. But just as there was a time for Jesus to take up his cross, there will be a time when we will have to make that choice ourselves. Or just stop and think, are you avoiding it? Or have you already made that choice? Now, what did Jesus actually say that was blasphemy? Caiaphas understood that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. But in order for us to fully understand what Jesus is saying in verse 62, we need to understand the idea that is behind coming on the clouds. God's coming on the clouds of heaven is a symbolic way of speaking his presence, judgment and salvation. All through the scriptures, God was coming on clouds in salvation of his people and in judgment of his enemies. If you don't know the song, Days of Elijah, look it up. The chorus is particularly glorious. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. This coming with the clouds is clearly second coming language. So when Jesus said he would come on the clouds, he was using the apocalyptic language of the prophets to identify himself as the Messiah the judge. Caiaphas reacted the way that he did because he knew that only God came on clouds. He knew that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah and he was angry. But I wonder if because he'd, he got caught up with so many rituals, he'd forgotten that it says in Exodus, the high priest's robe was specifically constructed so that it could not be torn. And also, the book of Leviticus told him that Aaron and successive high priests were commanded not to tear their garments. Even when Aaron's sons died, he was forbidden to show his grief in this matter, for the robe and the symbol of his calling to the priesthood had to be kept intact. And interestingly, when Caiaphas tore his robe, he tore away the priesthood from himself and all those who were to follow, violating the covenant with God. Now, we must remember that it's not an ignorant mob who acted on Jesus' claims, but the leader and teachers, the creme de la creme of the nation. And Jesus could not leave such a challenge unanswered. Silence, then would have been an abandonment of his claims. It was fitting that the representatives of the nation should, at that moment, hear him declare himself as the Messiah. And it was not fitting that he should be condemned on any other ground. Verse 56 tells us, many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. But they should have known better. As the ninth commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. I mean, God loves the truth as it reflects his holy nature. And he hates false witness and lying lips. And we know that Christ is the way, the truth and the life. And here, Jesus gives us an example of keeping quiet at times and of speaking at other times. Ask yourself, what type of situations do I feel I can handle best silently? When is it best for me to speak? What are some examples in my life that I can think of from both speaking and keeping quiet? Can you ask God for help? when you feel your words are getting out of hand? And can you say sorry when they have? 
I think that that little phrase about Peter in verse 54, and he followed him at a distance, is a description that many of us Christians today have. In this passage, the disciples followed Christ, their Lord and Saviour. But there was always at a distance, not wanting to get too close, not wanting to be identified in such close association with him. How about you? Are you following at a distance? Or do you make sure that everyone knows that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Father God, help us not to bear false witness, but to tell the truth. Show us how to return good for evil. Give us the ability to stay silent and the wisdom to speak well and the strength to say sorry. Stir up our hearts so that we don't want to stand at a distance, but get closer to you then we can truly know, love and follow you. Amen. And so let's pray together. Visit this place, O Lord, we pray, and drive far from it the snares of the enemy. May your holy angels dwell with us and guard us in peace. And may your blessing be always upon us, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In peace we will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make us dwell in safety. Abide with us, Lord Jesus, for the night is at hand and the day is now past. As the night watch looks for the morning, so do we look for you, O Christ. May the risen Lord Jesus bless us, May he watch over us and renew us as he renews the whole of his creation. And may our hearts and lives echo his love. Amen.